chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to speak in the synagogue at Nazareth. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from him. They said, is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And Jesus said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up and drove Jesus out of town and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl Jesus off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. The Lord be with you. O loving Lord, help us to hear what you've really said and to dare to live it. Open our hearts and minds to the good news. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a story about a new preacher. The new preacher was called by the congregation, showed up, and his first Sunday was on. And everyone was excited. They couldn't wait to hear what the preacher was going to preach. And he preached a sermon. And they got to the end of it and they thought, hmm, okay, not bad. That was pretty good. And everyone was pretty happy. So they came back the next Sunday, and they were excited to hear, what's he going to say now? And he started preaching, and a few of them in the congregation were going, this sounds familiar. By the end of it, they realized it was the same sermon he had preached the week before. But they wrote it off kind of like, oh, you know, he's settling in, you know, unpacking the house. They're doing all of, oh, we'll just, we'll just ride along. So they show up for week three. And week three, they're excited. What's he going to say? And he starts preaching. And this time they figured it out a little sooner. It was the exact same sermon, week three. So I don't know what we might expect, but in that congregation, there started to be chitter chatter amongst the people. You know the stuff where people are doing behind the scenes phone calls? So the president of the church council was called upon, ask him what's going on. And so the church council president met with the new pastor and said, well, pastor, um, we're starting to have some questions about your sermon. You've preached the same sermon three weeks in a row. What's up with that? And the new pastor said, well, no one's taken the first one seriously yet, so how can we move on? <laughs> this morning, we are getting part of last week's gospel reading into this week's gospel reading, a transitional verse, if you will. Jesus has, is in his hometown. He has just, of Nazareth, just read from the prophet Isaiah, and he preaches a nine-word sermon. Today in your hearing, this has been fulfilled. It's good news. You see, Jesus is announcing that 
the promises given through the prophets, that God through the prophets had proclaimed good news was coming, Jesus is now saying, it's here right now. Now, English is so limiting. Greek, Koine Greek, gives us these little extra insights. And the extra insight in what Jesus has preached is, he is saying, what I've said to you has already been accomplished and the effects of it are continuing. Already God has brought this about. Now, what we see in Jesus is from there on, he's showing us what it looks like. He heals the sick. He restores sight to the blind. He meets with people like Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he? He meets with outcasts. He's welcoming others in. He is showing what this look like, looks like, and what he's showing is God is truly God, a God of authentic love. Love that welcomes, love that serves, love that reaches out and changes life, love that liberates. Jesus announces right there in Nazareth, this is what God's up to. The time has come and is now. It's already so. What we also see in the rest of the story is the response of the world. It leads to a point where indeed the religious and the civic authorities end up doing their best to stop Jesus. They nail him to a cross. That's pretty darn good. He dies and he's buried. But God is not yet done. Here's the end of the story. God wins. God refuses to allow even death to be that barrier any longer. He resurrects Jesus He's welcoming us into this new age, this new community, this new life where we are utterly freed by the love of God. St. Paul helps us to understand that in the water of baptism, Paul tells us we are yoked, we are connected, we are made one with Jesus in his death and his resurrection. In baptism, the fullness of God's promises are poured into our lives. We are set free. All of God's promises are already fulfilled and will be fulfilled continuously. It's good news. So what is the response to Jesus' very first sermon? Well, at first they're, they're all amazed. They're all like, wow, that's pretty cool what he's saying. This is astonishing. One of our hometown boys Look what he has said. Look what he's doing. He is, he's bringing this good news. And then, who would have thought it? Oh, wait a minute. Isn't that Joseph's boy? You know Joseph, the carpenter? We, we know what he's really like, who he really is. And before long, they're marching him out to a hill with the intent of hurling him over a cliff. What's our response? How do we respond to that good news? Jesus is inviting us into that way of life where we are liberated and we can be. So what's that look like? Our ministry this past week included a moment that any one of us could have been part of. A gentleman who is a neighbor on the street tossed onto our property a six-page letter. It's a painful letter. This young man explained how his mother had died. He became angry at God. He threw out all the Bibles in the house. And he knew that from then on, God was mad at him and how he was struggling, 
how alone he was, how hurt he was, and that if something didn't change soon, he would be no more. So the way it unfolds is that at about 7.30 in the morning as I'm coming into the building, this becomes, uh, uh, Richard from the Lyceum had found the note and brought it to me, and by 7.45 I had tracked down who this man was with the help of our daily bread across the street. He was in my office, and we were talking and praying and getting him the help that he needs. Hopefully now with the interventions that have taken place, he'll become stabilized and be able to start working through the pain. But it took getting involved in daring to trust that God had brought to that moment what was needed to share good news in the ways that he needed most. Sisters and brothers, that's everyday life for you and me. Trusting that God has done all that's needed and that we can be vessels that care and carry that to others. It didn't take me being ordained by the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America to be able to pray with him, to be able to talk with him. Maybe I've got a little more experience in some things, so do you. You have experience in things that I don't. But together, God has given us all we need that we can live this out. We can dare to love others. We can also dare to love ourselves. We can dare to forgive others. Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes we put all kinds of roadblocks in the way. But we can forgive others, and we can forgive ourselves. You see, Jesus' word to us is that God has set us free. The gospel is not just some sweet idea. We don't gather in here just around a sweet idea. We gather around a promise that's fulfilled and is transformational that God's love is for you and me, and we can dare to live in that, to be that. Pope Francis, in his comments about baptism, had been po um, pointing folks to the concept of our true responses when we pour ourselves out in service and there find life. You see, the response to the sermon sometimes is you want to take the preacher out and throw him off the cliff. I'm thankful there are no cliffs in Galveston. <laughs> but what is our response to Jesus' sermon? To receive that good news, to trust that he really is making it real for us, and that our lives can reflect that. How will you respond to the sermon? Amen.